This is ESG Decoded, the podcast powered by Climco to provide relevant, actionable updates related to business innovation and sustainability. Join Caitlin Allen and Amanda Shea of Climco for thoughtful, nuanced conversations with industry leaders that explore the complexities, the risks, and the opportunities connected to all things ESG. I'm Yvonne Harris, a consultant and a co-host, and I will be collaborating with Caitlin and Amanda for the discussions that we will present on this podcast. Put simply, ESG is everything that's not on your balance sheet. This leaves room for misunderstanding, oversimplification, and the tendency towards one-size-fits-all perspectives. None of that will happen on this podcast. Enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to ESG Decoded. Today, we are going to take our listeners on a journey through a life cycle assessment, the what, the why, and the how. And we are going to learn a lot about asphalt. I have two guests today, Dave Henderson of Asphalt Materials and Gary Yoder of Climco to lead us on this journey. Dave and Gary, welcome. Hi, Caitlin. Thanks so much for being here, y'all. So I'm going to start by providing a little bit of background on you two. Dave Henderson is the Vice President of Specialty Products for Asphalt Materials, Inc., a heritage group company. Dave has been in the asphalt industry for 30 years and has commercialized multiple asphalt technologies throughout the United States, as well as China and Brazil. Dave has an undergraduate degree in finance and an MBA and lives in Zionsville, Indiana with his wife, Danny. Gary Yoder is the Vice President of Environmental Services at Climco. He has 30 years of experience providing environmental compliance consulting services, primarily to industrial sector clients. He has been with Climco for eight years and currently supports and manages projects in Climco's Sustainability Policy and Advisory Business Unit. He has a master's in meteorology and works out of his home office in Raleigh, North Carolina. Gary and Dave, so happy to have you. Great to be here, Caitlin. Thank you. Good to be here. And just to give a little context to our listeners, so Gary and I work together at Climco, of course, and Dave is with Asphalt Materials, which is a heritage company. Heritage is also an investor in Climco. So that's a really great relationship that we value a lot here. And we came together, Climco came together with Asphalt Materials to actually do this life cycle assessment for one of Dave's products called J-Band. And that case study is actually available on our website, and we'll be putting that resource boost in the episode here. But we thought it would be a really great opportunity to to kind of walk listeners through that process and hear a little bit more of the details about it. So that's the origin of this episode. But we wanted to start by getting you all excited about asphalt, because I don't know if anyone else is as passionate about asphalt as Dave and Gary are. So let's start with that. So I learned from Dave that asphalt is one of the most recycled materials by weight in the U.S. So by how much, Dave? Uh, Actually, by quite a large margin, Caitlin. We recycle nearly 90 million tons of pavement annually. And I believe all combined paper, glass, and aluminum are somewhere on the scale of, you know, 50, 60 percent of that. So it's, it's significant, the amount of material that goes back into the road, comes off the road and goes back into the road. That's amazing. So 50% more than all of those other products you mentioned, paper, glass, aluminum. Multiply that by two, and that's how much asphalt gets recycled. R- roughly so. I'm confident in the asphalt numbers, but I had to get the paper, glass, and aluminum from mm-hmm. various sources. And so I don't know if maybe you know some specific type was omitted, but I don't think with the numbers that far apart, I don't think it would close the gap very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I think that's so interesting because obviously we all drive on asphalt. It's all over the place, right? But it's not something you really pay attention to every day necessarily. <laughs> so that's really interesting to know. That So I guess it kind of begs the question, how much new asphalt is being made? Or is, is it the chance is pretty good that new asphalt being laid on a roadway near you is actually recycled? That's a great question. And um I I would say it's a combination of those two statements. So Mm. some portion of most pavements. So most of that recycled pavement goes back into a new mixture in a small quantity. 
but your your highest traffic and high profile pavements also often are specified by the government not to have recycled be all new materials just so they're of the highest quality think of your your big interstates going through houston some of those will have provisions where they don't want recycled materials because it can be consumed on so many other roadways, lower traffic roadways. Interesting. Wow. Okay, so you've got me interested in asphalt. <laughs> you have to say that with a straight face for me to believe it. <laughs> so I no, I I think it is really interesting though because these are the sorts of things that make you know make modern life move around. You know, help us move around the country. You know it's part of daily life in in our country and and really all around the world so it's the sort of thing we all should be paying attention to i think let's talk about j band so j band is the product of asphalt materials that you guys chose to do a life cycle assessment on so before we get to what lca is tell us a little bit about j band so when roads are built you often see like if you're driving on a multi-lane road you'll see the striping to delineate the lanes well, typically those also delineate two separate paver passes. So a paver comes and lays a um, one lane of asphalt and then they back up and they lay the adjacent lane. And one of the weakest areas of that pavement is where those two lanes come together. It's called the longitudinal joint. So it runs typically near the stripes. And if you watch roads as you're driving, you'll typically see that's the first place where distress creeps in. And so, in the early 2000s, we worked with different transportation agencies and really isolated the problem being permeability. Since those joints aren't truly knitted together, air and water get in there and start to wreak havoc on the pavement and basically unglue the asphalt from itself. You know, they, they work the age, the pavement, and it starts to break apart or ravel or crack. And so j band which is also goes by the name void reducing asphalt membrane when agencies consume it or longitudinal joint seal like in, in a couple instances and the material is meant to be placed before the paving is done so we put the, the vram in place and then build the road over top of it contrary to the historic practice and very common practice of letting the road crack and begin to fail and then going out and filling that with new material crack sealing or crack filling, they call it. So we try to prevent the problem before it starts is what's unique about j -Band. Okay, so you're an asphalt company. You have a product that you think is going to increase the lifespan of a roadway, reduce the need to refill, so reducing the need for trucks to go out, reducing the disruption to traffic, reducing the need for additional material, and you're thinking, hmm, maybe there's some quantifiable benefits to this. Is that kind of how it started, the thought process? No, that, that was the exact thought I had. Oh. Hmm, there's some quantifiable benefits. No, actually what we started with in the product launch back in 2016 is we started with the um, what we thought were the two most important factors of safety and economics. And so we really tried to evaluate, you know, how a a government agency spends money to upkeep a road. And in the process of that, what we calculated was it took a lot more maintenance trips and thus a lot more money to maintain a road that did not have J-band. And in a discussion, it was kind of a natural question to ask, well, what about the impact of the environment that would have keeping all those trucks going out to maintain that pavement off the road in the first place? And so in the same way that we did a life cycle analysis of the economic value of using J-Band, we decided to work with Climto to perform a life cycle assessment of the sustainability aspect of keeping those trucks off the road. Okay, you've brought it up, so I've got to, I've got to go there. Analysis versus assessment. So <laughs> we've got life cycle analysis, and we kind of, I'll just say, I, as a non-environmental engineer, I use them interchangeably, but you've just given us sort of a more granular definition of analysis versus assessment. Do you want to kind of explain that a little bit? Well, I'll offer the asphalt industry's perspective the best I understand it, but would defer to Gary on the broader, you know, environmental use of the different terms. But in our business, we talk a lot about life cycle cost assessment, and it's how two different types of construction methods are compared to each other in terms of the economic value or costs 
they they incur for the agency. Whereas in the industry vernacular around sustainability, we refer to life cycle assessment. So just one C in the A is assessment. If you think about it, analysis and assessment are virtually interchangeable. But I think it's good for our industry to focus on one versus the other because they'd be easy to confuse, right? When you go to a seminar and they're going to talk about LCA, if there's two C's, it's economic. If there's one C, it's probably going to be environmental. So that that's that's what we have found because we're very early in this, you know, this um, endeavor in terms of quantifying this as a product. And I would agree with Dave. He did a great job explaining that. And it's just to me, it's easier to separate the two financial versus environmental slash sustainability, which is ESG. So and the obviously the analyses are completely different. So, Gary, in in your experience, people are saying generally saying life cycle analysis or assessment. So what or does it just depend on the industry? I've actually seen analysis and assessment used interchangeably on the life cycle ESG side of things. But as Dave explained, I think it's a good way to separate the two types of of studies and analysis being financial and assessment being environmental ESG. So yes, I've seen both though. Okay. And I think ISO, the International Standards Organization, they use assessment. Am I right? That is correct. Yeah, the yeah. 14,040 and 44 use assessment. That's really helpful. And, you know, at the end of the day, to your point, Dave, assessment and analysis are not that far apart in terms of the dictionary definition. But, um, you know, as all, all this evolves, I think it's great to hear from folks that are in the weeds with it, what their thoughts are on on verbiage. So thanks for sharing that. Little diversion. Okay, so back to the J band journey or the journey of this particular products LCA. So you guys have the the thought, okay, there's probably some quantifiable environmental and even possibly social benefits. So the safety aspects, you've already looked at that. And how did you identify kind of the right tool to use? Did you already kind of know about life cycle assessment or, you know, how did you choose that particular methodology? And then maybe Gary can explain a little bit about the methodology that you guys used. I think you have to go one step further and then work our way back, which is what Climco taught us. When we set out the initiative, we really thought what we wanted to do was develop an environmental product declaration. We see this tool being used more and more by government agencies to try to understand the effect on the environment of the materials that they're using taxpayer dollars to pay for. Well, in working with our partners at Climco, we understood you can't start by developing an EPD. There's precursor steps that we had to work with them to understand. And Mm -hmm. after they educated us on the process and the complexity, we really felt like, you know, understanding a life cycle assessment of our product against other, again, Gary will talk about the comparative nature of our analysis against other commonly used products was the best place for us to start learning and then understand how to move forward. (laughs) <laughs> Let's help listeners understand what an environmental product declaration or EPD is. And then you can tell us a little bit more about starting with the comparative LCA. Okay, well, I'll back up. The step before the EPD is the product category rule, so the PCR. So the PCR is basically the framework and methodology for developing an EPD and life cycle analysis for a particular product. So PCRs are developed for all kinds of uh, categories such as masonry or asphalt or maybe steel. There's there's different groups and it's they're, they follow an ISO standard to be developed. There's stakeholders that are involved. There's program operator that, you know, collects the information from all of the stakeholders and manages it and eventually gets to the point where it gets it goes to a panel for review and then finally approved. And so it's it gets stamped as approved. And then within that PCR, now you have the framework for developing the EPDs in that category. So the EPD is basically an environmental transparency label. I think Dave maybe even called it a, a food label <laughs> for pro- products. I, I love that. So once the product has an EPD, then you're tying into where there's the policy in place for procurement of those products and raw materials. 
And we're seeing this as a growing trend. We learned about this in this particular project that there are places like the New York, uh, New Jersey Port Authority, New York State just this year introduced a Senate bill called the Climate Forward Leadership Act. It is basically a, a green procurement specifications bill. So what this basically means, and Dave can speak on this probably better than I can, I guess the, the traditional way of procuring materials for a project is in most cases I would expect is probably the lowest bidder, right? So now you've got an extra layer that's gonna be implemented and that with the EPD becoming part of the decision process, assuming you got two materials that perform the same, if one's got an EPD or or a more greener benefit to it, that would likely win out over its competitor that maybe is less sustainable or less of an environmental impact. So that's what Dave was talking about with an EPD. So we were talking about that initially with this project, but then we backed up, like he said, and and basically developed in this particular case a comparative LCA for the J band product. So what that was was comparing the J band. So what Dave just explained of how it works, it basically works from the, you know, it's laid down first before the, the asphalt lifts are put in place. And, you know, the heat from the asphalt actually fills the void from below versus the other alternatives that we compared it to, traditional alternatives. And Dave again can back me up on on these particular alternatives, but one would be adhesive the sealant. So you've got the lift. And so now you've got this this newly fresh paved roadway or on one side of the road and you've got this you know the edge on the center line and the other road hasn't been paved yet so they'll put down an adhesive a glue and then the other lane will be a, a put on beside it so it, it seals it and it'll, or it'll it'll glue it together as an adhesive and then they put a sealant on top of it that's one alternative we also looked at uh, the paved wide trim back so what you need as rigid as a possible of a lift to actually butt that new that new lane up against right so the pave wide trim back they'll they'll put pavement out about six inches past the center line and then mill it off to make a kind of a wall of the asphalt and and then of course put the other lane beside it and then the other alternative was the infrared heater which is a device that's connected to the paver itself it's propane fired it basically heats up that pavement on that center lane so that when the other other lift beside it is put on it it helps seal seal that joint dave anything you want to add I, I think you did a good job with that, Gary. And again, I think, you know, going back to the beginning as Climco helped us, what we really wanted to avoid was any appearance of greenwashing and making claims about our product that weren't um, able to be factually substantiated. And Climco and their credibility really helped us have confidence in our claims and know that, you know, they were being measured appropriately and, and therefore talked about appropriately. That's such an important thing right now because there is so much greenwashing and people throw the terms around and we're extremely careful with our clients about any types of claims. And, you know, sometimes the client will be like, we want to claim this or that. And we're like, nope, you can't say that until we look at all the numbers and really validate it. And if it's if it's not, it's not. And you can't you shouldn't say it. Right. Not just for being honest and correct and having an integrity, but also because they can open you up to legal liability. Okay, so we've decided to develop a comparative LCA, you know, chosen from a number of other things that might have been done as a first step. And then the comparative nature of this LCA means you look at multiple other, I guess, methods to do the same thing, right? And just to and evaluate what are the different impacts of those different methods. So Gary, you've just explained the different methods. What what did you do now? So you identified those things to measure and then then what? It would probably help to explain the difference between what most people know as an LCA versus this comparative LCA, right? So the, L the LCA following the 14,040 slash 14,044 methodology, that's basically a compilation and evaluation of of inputs and outputs for and potential environmental impacts for a product for example so you're looking at you know the five life cycle stages of raw material extraction transportation manufacturing all of those things right a waste where, where it finally goes in this particular case for a comparative lca 
we know that there are going to be impacts that are common across all of the alternatives. For example, for J band or whether you're doing the uh, adhesive sealant or the pave wide trim back, you're going to have asphalt, right? You're going to have new asphalt brought to the project. The impacts of manufacturing that asphalt, transporting it there, <clears throat> putting it on the road with the machinery, all that's going to be common across all of the alternatives. So because LCAs in their truest form, you're really, it's difficult if maybe not impossible in some cases to compare them because they really are case specific. In this case, we eliminated across these alternatives, the common impacts so that we are only looking at what the key differences are between these alternatives that I mentioned. And then doing that, quantifying it with metrics of the impacts, environmental impacts for each alternative. That's really helpful. So a just sort of regular LCA looks at either, you know, cradle to gate or cradle to grave or whatever boundary you want to put on of one particular product. Comparative eliminates the things that are the same and just looks at those parts that are different. So you make the assumption that kind of the same asphalt's coming from the same manufacturer. It's going to the same place after you know, and you just look at the the impacts of the different the differences essentially. Exactly. You have it. Okay. So great. So you've identified the different things that you're going to compare. Now what? Now a lot of data gathering. <laughs> so there was a couple of things that we did for for AMI in this and, and a couple of questions we wanted to answer. One was, you know, how does J Band compare? to these alternatives from a sustainability standpoint, you know, for longitudinal joint solutions, right? Which we talked about. And the other thing was, was really who would be most interested in this, assuming that we get the outcome that we wanted. And in the process of doing the audience assessment was also the fact gathering and the data that we needed to actually uh, develop the metrics for this particular analysis. So there were two, or three categories that we actually developed the metrics for. One was greenhouse gas emissions, CO2E. We did air quality. Um, there was four pollutants in that group. We just uh, combined them and called a, a, you know, a pound of pollutant. So it was VOC, carbon monoxide, NOx, and fine particulate matter. And we also included the safety aspect too, uh, the benefits or and or you know, in some cases it could not be a benefit. We wanted to, to be clear and concise and transparent about this process going in and coming out and what we did. So, so there was a process of actually gathering the data for calculating the emissions, the safety aspects, you know, CO2 emissions. And we actually ultimately developed a, a calculator tool. And the calculator is based on a, what's well, got a baseline uh, project that's one mile long. And it's 30 miles away from the manufacturer, meaning where J-Band would be manufactured. OK, and, and so I think 50 miles for one alternative from transporting the equipment to the site. So like the infrared heater, the pave white tri trim back. So the two materials that would be transported there would be J band and the adhesive. So those two are kind of similar from a material standpoint in manufacturing. So that's the baseline, right? So we calculated the the impacts on a baseline project of that length and those distances. And then the tool can be flexible. So they could use it for different projects, different lengths, different distances from the manufacturing site. And we came up with some, you know, on the baseline with some very nice and I think uh, beneficial results in that in really all cases for the baseline scenario, J-Band outperformed three alternatives in all three categories, significantly in air quality and safety. Dave, do you want to add anything to that in terms of process? So for so technically you were the client rate. So what was what was the lift on your end to do this? Well, you know, Gary talks about it so simply, but when you're from the outside coming in, it's it's very complicated. The the mechanics that go into these calculations, you know, the the size of the motor, of the type of the truck and how what the fuel efficiency is, because all of that matters so much, especially when you're talking about you know, hauling materials out to a roadway to perform maintenance. That That's where both the economic and the sustainability cost differential comes from. So Gary really educated us on just the specifics that are needed to make it meaningful. That's probably my biggest takeaway and the, and the biggest lift. One of the biggest lifts was learning about asphalt and these alternatives. 
So there was time we spent with the AMI folks and they were super supportive. Uh, there was what five or six of them on that side that were heavily involved in, in every call, all the data that we needed, the questions that we had, but we even had specific calls and, you know, hey, Dave, you know, <laughs> what is pave wide trim back? You know, just explaining the basics to of, of, of everything about the asphalt and, and uh, the application of this material and the these alternatives both in a very acronym intensive industry i so know it's kind of alphabet soup some days it, it totally is and i've got a list for our listeners like fear not there will be a list of all the acronyms in this episode <laughs> in the episode description i was going to ask dave to, so it sounds like don't do it if you're not committed to working on it right because there's a lot of Absolutely. yeah this isn't something you can just kind of here, consultant, like figure it out. Like it does require a, some internal data gathering. I'm sure there was a lot of, sounds like some education, but also a lot of kind of back and forth on understanding what, to, to get to those correct or the most appropriate factors. Absolutely. That, that's a, a great summary, Caitlin. I think for us, you know, we, we were just seeking the truth. And so we had the number of people we did on the team because it was very cross-functional. We had people that were experts in paving, people that were experts in material science. And we had a, an assortment of, we have mechanical engineers, chemical engineers. We, we had a very cross-functional team so that we could really get to the details that Gary needed to give us the product that we needed to have confidence in what we were saying about our material. You know, Dave said what Gary needed. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Emily Damon, who who is our business unit leader, our sustainability and policy and advisory business unit leader. And she was she was instrumental with her experience in, in guiding us through this project. And, and Caroline Keller, who was, she was the glue. She did an excellent job, amazing job of pulling a lot of this data together and uh, really, really moving this project along. So it was a team, big How, team. Thank you for pointing that out, Gary. They, they yeah. were great, all great to work with. Absolutely. That's awesome, guys. We love to hear it. How long did it take, you know, from say kickoff call to it was done, right? I mean, how I know, and I, I know every product is different in the in level of complexity. So it might not be the same for a different product or a different industry, but I'm curious about how long did it take you guys? So we started in April, 2021, Dave, I'd have to look that up, but I think it was around that time of the year. Is that right? That, seem, that seems about right. Yeah. yeah, there's still some aspects of it that are ongoing, but I think we finished it up in March. So it was about a good year-long project. Wow. About like four. <laughs> Sorry, <Dave>. <laughs> You're really <laughs> selling it, Dave. <laughs> An enjoyable four years, but it did. It, it, okay, yeah, it, thanks for that. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. It was. So all of this said, right, was it worth it? Okay, it felt like four was really hard. But but was it worth it? You know, what what are kind of your next steps now that you know, say you were seeking the source of truth for this, like now that you know the truth and it really truly does outperform on some of these key ENS categories, the environment and safety. What are you doing with that information? That That's an excellent question. And um, really where we are now is we've gotten past the self-confidence phase, right? Now we know what we're talking about and we have confidence in it. And so what we're really seeking to do now is align with um, two very important trade groups in our industry. One is the National Asphalt Pavement Associations. That is over all the people who build the asphalt roads. And then the other is the Asphalt Institute, who's over the other material providers like us. We're, we're a member of both, but we're really, really heavily involved in the Asphalt Institute. And they are both working very hard, as Gary talked about, the complex product category rules to establish EPDs. We are just an individual product. They're working on industries and how this all works. And so it's important to us that we know how we align with these two important trade groups so that we can both be supportive but yet push our product as fast as we can for acceptance into the market. Because until six years ago, this product wasn't used on roads other than in experiments and evaluative projects, where now it's we're in the commercialization effort. So we, we need that data to go out and tell our story more than just economic, more than just safety. Now we know how it fits into the sustainability landscape. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And I find, you know, this is kind of a theme of across industries. And, you know, it's probably been a theme since the internet came about and shook everything up, right? Is that there's constant change and constant innovation. And often the the products, the technologies are out way ahead of regulation. They're out way ahead of kind of industry agreement on what rules should be or how to measure or even what terminology to use. It's a story we hear in lots of industries, but it sounds like that's squarely where the National Asphalt Pavement Association and Asphalt Institute are as well, just trying to kind of get their heads around what are the options for reducing the environmental impact of the industry overall. Did I summarize that well? I think that's a fair statement. Again, it's complicated. It's hard to talk about, right? I mean, we're, we're trying to figure out exactly how to say what you just tried to say correctly. You know, what is the impact? And um, how, how do we measure one versus the other, which is the importance of, Gary always reminds us that it's comparative. You know, how do we compare to something? It's not necessarily an absolute per se. I think when you get to the EPDs, the food label of what a product is, that's a little more absolute. And we're just not there yet. The industry is working in that direction, and, and I believe we'll get there. But right now, we want to understand, as we're talking to an agency, if you use our product, what, what are the benefits you can expect in the three categories, economic, from a safety standpoint, and from a sustainability standpoint? That That's really helpful. Okay, so knowing what you do now, would you do it again? <laughs> okay. I, I believe the answer to that is yes, and, and okay. I think... I think many of our products will fall in a, I don't know, I don't know the right term for this, but I'm going to call it an industry catch-all sustainability measurement. A lot of things we sell, many other companies sell. We're trying to introduce a new technology that, as I said, wasn't used six years ago. I think we had to go above and beyond. So we may not do as heavy of a lift. But I think understanding how all of our products affect sustainability for our stakeholders, the traveling public and the user agencies, I think that's very important. And, and that's why I reference AI and Napa. That's where they're going to make sure our industry goes. And we want to be good members and supporters of those efforts. AI and Napa being, again, the, the associations we mentioned before. Fantastic. Fantastic. I think this has been so helpful to kind of walk through the nitty gritty of an assessment with with both of you. Really, really grateful for you for getting way in the weeds. And I don't know, some of our listeners might have uh, had to skip fast forward, but I actually like that we're able to have some of these more technical focused podcasts since joining Crime Co. You know, Legacy Global Affairs Associates didn't, we didn't do a ton of technical environmental work. We were focused on ESG reporting, communication strategy. So I think it's really cool. And um, if you're an engineer or sort of technician type listener, um, please let us know if you've enjoyed this, because I think it's been very interesting. Uh, so I, I'm just so grateful that y'all have both been on to talk about this. But let's kind of shift gears to something a little fun before we wrap up. And that is, I understand that you're a basketball fan, Dave. Is that right? I am. I am, particularly college basketball. It's, it's uh, just such an exciting um, event, especially the the tournament at the end of the year, the March Madness in the Final Four. You're in Indianapolis, right? Yes, That's the Heritage Group is based here in Indianapolis, which, by the way, is where the NCAA is based. And so we've been fortunate to host the tournament here on the past. Well, isn't that the one? Didn't Climco help? Gary, you can tell me this is before my time, but didn't Conco help make one of the NCAA um, championships carbon neutral? With yeah, offsets? the the twenty twenty one championship. Oh my god, that's so cool! So that was the one in in Indianapolis, right? I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> yes, thank you. I had to pause for a second. I wasn't quite sure, but yes. Oh, this is cool. Yeah. So um, we'll include this link too. But Climco helped to make the NCAA Division One Men's Basketball Championship carbon neutral in Indianapolis. So did you go, Dave? This was last year in 2021. No, I did not. Uh, tickets to that were very limited. That was still uh, in COVID times. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, darn it. Darn it. But I watched all of it on television and I, I saw the uh, the story about this. So it's oh. just like, super exciting. And I'm just you know, good 
good for our local community and and good to be associated on a project like this with Glenco. Another yeah. project. Another project. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. Well, I'm getting into basketball because my my kids are. So I had to dust off my old my old skills from seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a it's lot a of great fun. sport for them to get involved in it is yeah it's a lot of fun i know we have a lot to get back to today but i'm so grateful that y'all spent time with me today on esgd coded i think it's really really cool to go into the technical weeds of the types of work that we do and you know help folks understand that yes there's a lot of greenwashing out there but there's also a lot of really good work happening to truly understand and quantify the impacts of different products and different methodologies for how to do things. And I think all of that helps us, helps agencies, helps customers, helps the government, helps everyone kind of make better decisions that can hopefully have impact economy-wide on, on how we do business, on how we build things. Caitlin, it was great to be here today and have the chance to speak with you. And, and it's always good to see my friend, Gary. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you for listening to ESG Decoded. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you consume yours and follow ESG Decoded and Climco across social media platforms. Until our next episode, take what you learned today to drive long-term value for your organization by doing good for people and the planet.